Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am so happy that you are joining me today for another author interview. Today I'm speaking with author Mariucha Mila about her book, Meet Me in Milano, which is a story of a young woman named Melinda and her time in Italy. It's about Melinda, but it's also about her um, ex-boyfriend, Jonathan, and a variety of characters who surround her. So while it is ostensibly Melinda who's the main character, there's also this cast of characters that surround her and really help to fill out her story and help to give a bigger picture of not only Melinda's story, but Melinda's story, Jonathan's story, the story of these two young people who move to a different continent and discover things about themselves, about their relationships, about life in general. And this cast of characters really helps to round out that story. So I do want to give you the description of the book, and it's this is from the Amazon description, which says, Meet Me in L- Milano is about a young architect who leaves her boyfriend and New York to look for a job and a new life in Milan. But her ex is not giving up so easily and follows her there. The people they meet, the places they visit, and the things they learn about themselves during their separate adventures will bring you right there with them as they navigate the Milanese scene. The reader will meet successful and charming Milanese men like Alberto and Pierpaolo, the wise Lella, the beautiful Elena, and aspiring creative types who, like Melinda and Jonathan, have come to Milan to realize their dreams. Meet Me in Milano weaves Italian culture, food, language, and personalities into a delightful mosaic. Weekend trips for work and play in the beautiful Italian landscape provide deeper dives into the conflicts and opportunities that bring the characters together or make them change direction. This is a book about the discovery of life and of self through connection with place and other people. So as I said, that is the description of Meet Me in Milano. And I one thing I loved about this book was just traveling through not only Milan, but Italy with the characters and getting to see different aspects of not only Italy, but the culture in these different places. And we'll talk more about this when I am speaking with Mariucha. It's almost like these little um, mini novels, mini books within the book where they go on these different weekend adventures and you get more of the characters, more of the stories encapsulated in these weekend trips, but you also get more of Italy, more of the culture. And I think that's partly what I loved so much about the book was traveling through Italy. I've never been to Italy. I've actually never been to Europe. I I wasn't one of those adventurous young women like Belinda who goes off on an adventure like that. Someday I hope to travel, but I love to read books where people travel and books that give me this overall picture, this, this wonderful overarching picture of a place. And this book really does that. But it gives you not just kind of that, oh, let's go to Italy and experience some of the touristy things, but more of let's go to Italy and live with Italian people and experience their culture and see what they uh, they do on a day-to-day basis. So it is a travel book, but it's also a book about finding yourself in a new culture, living within that culture, and experiencing yourself in a different way because of that new place, the new people that you're surrounded with, etc. So I think that's definitely enough out of me. I would like to turn now to that interview with author Mariucha Mila, and we'll talk about her book, Meet Me in Milano. So here's that interview. Hi, Mariucha. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you. How are you? 
I'm doing great. How are you? I'm well, thank you. So uh, we are here to talk about your book, Meet Me in Milano. But before we do that, if you could share with my listeners just a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Okay. Well, um, I uh, am from Western New York, the Finger Lakes region, and um, I went to college to study design, and I was very attracted to Italian design in Italy as I studied, and I went to New York to work for a couple of years when I graduated from college, but my big dream was to go to Milano. And so this book is kind of a way for me to go back and visit. It isn't autobiographical, um, but it has many elements in it that, that reflect my experiences. And it was the huge experience of my young life uh, going to Milan and being exposed to such a rich cultural environment. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about um, the plot? You said it's not autobiographical, but tell us a little bit about um, Melinda and her experiences. Well, it starts out similar to my experience because Melinda's in New York City and she's working in an architectural firm, and that was true for me as well. But what happens to Melinda is that she has a boyfriend there and they have a, a loss of trust. I won't go into detail because it's in the story, but um, basically there is a sort of almost like original sin between the two of them. They have a failed relationship and she just wants to go to Italy and work for a designer in Italy and she does it. But she's almost punishing herself for this failure at the same time. Um, her boyfriend, Jonathan, uh, is a little bit desperate about the fact that their relationship ended. And he feels very guilty about what happened, too. So he ends up going to Milan as well. But she doesn't know that he has gone. So they both are in Italy. And the the... Their story is a very simple story about a loss of trust and working towards uh, regaining it in some way. Um, so it's kind of a simple story, but they're kind of the uh, hinge around which all the other characters move. So it's almost as if the story is between them is not the only thing that's going on in this book. Right. So talk a little bit about some of those other characters, because there's really this rich array of characters that surround them. And um, even though initially they don't know that the, or Jonathan knows obviously that Melinda is in Milan, but she doesn't know that he's there, but they kind of interact with some of the same people. So talk about just that cast yeah. of characters and how that plays out in the book. Well, it's, it's really great because uh, Melinda develops a circle of friends and Jonathan develops a circle of friends. Melinda is in the world of architecture and Jonathan is in the world of photography, both very active uh, professional uh, environments in Milan uh, because of design and fashion and so on and so forth. So Melinda uh, is staying as a paying guest with an older woman named Lella. And Lella is for me, kind of, a, she's a more mature woman. She's wiser. She almost acts as a mentor to uh, Melinda. She's a very established person in, in Milanese social cir circle. So she is kind of a touchstone uh, for the younger woman in the book. Um, she has a cousin named Alberto, who is also a very elegant, cultured Milanese guy, and he's introduced into Melinda's circle as well. The boss, Jonathan's boss in the photography studio, his name is Pier Paolo. And Pier Paolo is another Italian male type, you know, in his 40s, I'm imagining. And he is uh, very vain. Uh, he's running this photography studio. He thinks he's fantastic. And he's very superficial in his relationships with women. In that studio, there is also uh, two other. There are also two other characters, Enrico and Elena. Now, Enrico is from Naples. He's Italian, and Elena is from near Bologna. She's from the country. Her father uh, is a big agri-industrial guy, and she comes to Milan because Pier Paolo meets her 
and and they have a flirtation. So she comes to Milan as his lover and works in his studio. So all of these people are working together and experiencing each other, uh, and there's a flirtation between Alberto and Melinda in Milan um, at Lella's house. There's a flirtation between Elena and Jonathan at the photography studio. So it's not really clear who's going to end up with whom and what these characters discover about themselves because of their interactions with the other people. Now, the three men that are in this, the, the three um, quintessentially Italian men, Enrico and Jonathan excluded, are Pier Paolo, Alberto, and, um, and they get they have the characteristics, I think, that many people associate with Italian men. You know, the womanizing, the unfaithfulness, their interpretation of how relationships should be, which is very fluid and convenient for them. And what I've tried to do with these character sketches is show that there are similarities among these men, Italian men, but there are also some differences and a lot of little nuances. So you may judge them differently from mm-hmm. one another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's this really rich cast of characters that helps to move the story and give you this sense of, it's almost like, um, I've, I've never been to Milan, but through your story, it almost feels like Milan is a little bit of a small town because of the relationships that develop with, uh, you know, with Lella. She's very... Um, involved in the community and she knows a lot of people as does Alberto. So I felt yes. like it was a little bit of a small town feel in this community. Yes, there is. And also um, the, the third male character uh, who is uh, meant to portray the Italian male is, is Giorgio, who is a very successful architect. So you see the circle around Lella and Melinda, Mel, and Giorgio developing with some other minor characters around them. And then the, on the other side of town, there's Pier Paolo's photo studio with Jonathan and Elena and Enrico and some other minor characters. And they do intersect because the photographers are involved in the big salone, which is the big furniture fair where all the designers come to Milan from all around the world. And so Melinda's crew is, is encountering Pier Paolo's crew and Jonathan's crew at an event. And they start, the two circles begin to collide, and then it becomes one big circle socially. And it is true what you're saying, that's very astute of you, that Milan is very much like a small town because there are little parishes that are based on either where you went to school or um, what profession you practice because it's all about work, Milan. So if you if you work all day, you may very well end up at uh, having a drink someplace with people from work or meeting clients or going to someone's house for dinner. And everyone there is connection. So it's constantly about, you know, work and productivity and socializing all mixed up together. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned that this was a way for you to revisit your time in Milan. And it's, it feels like it feels like a love letter from you to Milan. Can you, uh, how long did you live there? Well, I lived in Italy for 18 years, but in Milan for 10. Okay. Um, so during that 18 years, I was in Milan a lot, even though I was living more out in the country at, afterwards. But it is, yes, I thought that, you know, um, Milan is not the kind of place people think of when they want to go to Italy to take a trip. They want to go to uh, another city. Mm-hmm. Um, at one point, Jonathan is walking through a neighborhood in in Milan, and he's thinking about what Milan is really like. If you want, I can read you a few sentences from the book. Sure, yeah. So Jonathan crossed the canal and started wandering through the labyrinth of back streets, still in transition from a poor to a wealthy quarter. He thought of how fascinating the layers of a city were, peeling off, adapting, resurfacing, evolving contagiously through unrelenting change. This was a hard city to read at first glance. It wasn't Florence, that three-dimensional museum of the Renaissance, with its perfectly proportioned solids and voids and consistent vocabulary of detail. It wasn't Rome, with its luscious curves and attenuated domes, all sensual statues and splashing fountains. 
It wasn't Venice either with its deeply melancholy gilded beauty with decaying Byzantine richness. No, Milan was more reserved and businesslike, even in its most ancient quarters. With the conclusion of that quote, I am going to jump in here so that we can take our first break of the podcast. But when we come back, we will be speaking more about the book, of course, and more about Milan and all sorts of other topics. So stay tuned. You are listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we will be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast. Your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Mariucha Mila about her book, Meet Me in Milano, and we are going to get right back to that interview. Just as a reminder, Mariucha just read a passage from the book about Jonathan walking around Milan, and so she's going to expand upon that passage a little bit more with her insights about living in Italy, in Italy Excuse me, especially living in Milan. So let's get back to that interview. So that gives you kind of an idea of what this character, Jonathan, is perceiving as he goes to Italy. And again, one of the most important things about this book is how you can take yourself and put yourself into another situation and see how it changes you, see how you discover yourself. For me, that is the most incredible part of doing this expat experience was to go and live as if I were in, an, in another habitat completely. And obviously, it changes you and you change it. And you change everything around you. And that's kind of like a concept of ecology, social and environmental and everything else. And this is what fascinates me about going to different places. And you yourself have, have lived in different places. And you can attest, I think, to how you react differently in a different environment. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I haven't lived abroad, but there's definitely, I mean, even just living in different states here uh, has been a vastly different experience. Um, you mentioned in one of your emails when we were chatting the difference between living in Texas and California and moving from the Dallas area to Berkeley was a definite culture shock. So, Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yes, I can imagine that that would be incredible. And, and how... And you become much more of a three-dimensional person when you put yourself through these experiences. Now, Melinda is a pretty defective character. She's very, she's brave because she does things that require bravery. But really, she's pretty insecure. And, you know, she's faltering all the time. And she, she doesn't forgive herself. And, you know, her, you asked a question about her evolution uh, in your email to me. And I think throughout the book, she just makes one little nudge over into the direction of forgiving herself and trying to live a little bit in a different way um, where she's accepting other people's feelings for her and, um, and she's not as afraid as she was before. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I really appreciated about Melinda's character was how well you drew that in terms of her complexity. She's not just one thing. She's not just this brave young woman who goes to Milan for a new experience. I mean, she is very brave because she does just pack up and go by herself. But she is, um, it, there's a part where you describe her and it's this interesting I can't. I don't have the passage in front of me, but you describe her as, as brave, but also this, there's, this lack of self-confidence. So she's constantly kind of fighting between those two aspects of her character, you know, the, the braveness versus the lack of self-confidence, which, which seems almost like an oxymoron, but it's just the way so many of us are built. We have these, these differences inside of us. So you did a really nice job with Melinda, I think. Well, thank you. And, you know, Jonathan is, is 
depicted as kind of this good guy who solves everybody's problems and comes in and he's level-headed and he he takes care of everybody. But from certain from other characters' points of view, he's kind of annoying almost because he's he doesn't have enough of an edge. Some of the characters accuse him of not having much of an edge. And I think that's interesting too because you need to have characters like that that draw out everybody else's personalities. Um, and I think people who lose patience with somebody who is good like that, um, they almost serve to put them in, into some kind of relief. So, you know, one thing I'd like to mention to folks is, you know, this is my first book and I'm going to be uh, writing. I, I promised myself I would write five books in five years and this is the first one. And what I wanted to do with this book, well, first of all, it wasn't highly premeditated in the sense that I didn't sit down and lay out an outline and say, okay, this is what I want to have to happen and this is what I want to end. What I did is I created a setting and a series of circumstances and then I created the characters as I needed them. And then the characters, you know, this sounds kind of schizophrenic, but the characters started to make their own decisions and I kind of had to go along with what No, they, uh, you're what not the only author that has said that. So <laughs> <laughs> It's incredible. And you know, that is the greatest thing about writing because you you create these beings and then they take over your mm-hmm. <laughs> So I I think that's just so exciting. Yeah. You mentioned it five really five books in five years. Um, so I, I, you, def, you have a definite goal. What are you working on right now, if I can ask? Well, I am I have taken one of the characters from this book, Lella, who is, you know, in her 50s. Um, she's coming to the United States uh, for a few months. And... I decided to set this book in the in the small towns and the Finger Lakes because um, I'm a landscape architect. I didn't tell you that, but I studied design as an undergraduate and a graduate student, but I'm currently a landscape architect. And I want to capture uh, these landscapes as well as the people that are in them uh, because they're changing so rapidly. So this next book is going to be set in New York State, um, it's going to start at Cornell University in Ithaca, and it's going to bop around into three or four different places within the Finger Lakes, and you're going to meet some really interesting people. There'll be a few Italians in there because that's going to be the recurring theme in all my books. It's going to be about the contrasting cultures. And I think it's going to be a really fun book. I'm at the beginning of it, but um, it's already starting to take shape. And then what I'm hoping to do is next year – spend some more time in Italy because I want to go back and forth and book three will bring us all back into Italy again. So that's, that's my game plan. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's really important to create these contrasts and, and, and travel back and forth a little bit. And it's and landscape is going to be really important in this book as well and how people um, are affected by it. The seasons and the scenery and the beauty of the landscape and so on and so forth. Yeah. And when you mentioned landscape, uh, it just reminded me of something that you wrote in one of your emails. You mentioned um, Italy porn, which cracked me up. Um, but that's that's, yeah. that's the landscape, but it's also the whole experience of how people, um, ex- what, what people expect when they think of Italy. Um, so can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Sure. And, you know, I use the term Italy porn. It doesn't mean there's anything pornographic in this novel. In fact, right. there is sex in the book, but it's not described graphically at all. It's just, it's very much suggested. Um, I didn't want to get into that heavily romance genre, even though this is a romance of, of sorts. Um, I think when people think about Italy, they, most people love Italy. It's just incredible. It is a country that is so loved by everyone. And, Every time I've talked to people about my experiences in Italy, they say, why did you ever come back? Or, you know, oh, I loved it. I went here. I went there. And it's almost like everyone is dream, dream destination. And so, you know, when I think about Italy, I, I think people think about um, the food of landscape, 
the people being so open and friendly. And it is all those things, but it's a lot more than that. When I wrote this book, I really didn't want to do, you know, an eat, pray, love, or under the Tuscan sun. I didn't want to get into a stereotypical image of Italy. I wanted to focus on the little gestures that people do every day, like preparing a cappuccino or making some pasta, eating with their friends, that are such an important part of Italian culture, such an important part of the social fabric. I don't know if you got that when you when you read the book. Just you you mentioned it so casually that you 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 almost can miss it. But there there is that thread running throughout the book with the with the cappuccino in the morning or the the risotto that Lilla and Melinda often make together. That's right, and and you know, Italy porn means anything about Italy that people who are attracted to Italy want to see or experience or or learn about. So yes, the book is is definitely meant to be Italy porn. It um, it takes place mostly in Milan, but there are two weekend trips to Rome. Uh, there are two weekend trips to Lake Como. There's a weekend trip to Naples, and there's a weekend trip to uh, a beautiful farm estate near Bologna. Um, all of which are places that people go to regularly who live in Milan. Now. One thing I really like about taking people out of Milan is it's really a key part of the urban experience is going to your friends, parents' houses in another place, uh, a vacation home, a weekend home, in the mountains, at the sea, wherever. And when you go to live in a big city like New York City or San Francisco, you know, if if you're in San Francisco, maybe you go to Tahoe. Um, You know, if you're... In New York, you you go out to Long Island or up into the Hudson River Valley. And and if you're in Boston, you go to Cape Cod. If you're in Italy, you go down to Santa Margarita or you go to the lake. And I tried to put that in the book to show you that living in Milan isn't just about being in the city pounding the pavement all the time. It's also about the opportunities that you get because you're there and you're meeting all these people and somebody has a house in Tuscany, someone else has an apartment in Venice, And you get access to all these experiences because you went to a big city and got engaged in the life rather than just going on a tour. And that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, and it really does give you a fuller picture of life. I mean, it obviously gives you a picture of life in Milano, but then it gives you this fuller picture of life just in Italian culture and this, again, this sort of small town feel where the community develops around the the characters. I remember when I um, when I lived in New York City, um, I kept running into the same people. And at one point we said, it's almost as if this is a play and all the other people are props. And we're, we're the ones who are acting in this play. And, and it's true. When you go to a big city, you do find these little uh, communities of people uh, that become your reality. And the rest of the city is this big fabric that you have to wiggle your way through to get to them. And, and the other important thing about these, this going away for the weekend, which is important in this book, and going away for the weekend is where everything gets resolved at the end when they all go to the town of Santa Margarita, which is on the Riviera. Um, it's kind of like in a Shakespeare play where the characters end up in the forest and all the magic happens there, and then they can go back to their daily lives with all their problems resolved. So one of the things I liked the most about being in Europe was that you would get invited on these weekends with a certain group of people, and that would be, that would be the cast of characters for your weekend. And you would be with those people on Friday night for dinner, on Saturday for breakfast, on the walk Saturday afternoon, for dinner Saturday night, and so on. So a little scenario would develop around these people in this certain place, and I just love the magic of that. It's just something that really appeals to me. It's like putting five people onto a stage and throwing some things up there and seeing what happens. It's an experiment. It's it's almost like little mini novels within the novel, you know, because you get this this encapsulated yes. weekend with this specific group of people. Yeah, and in that sense, you know, 
I guess you could say this book is, has that kind of postmodern feeling to it where there's a lot of different stuff going on besides the story. The story is kind of a mechanism and it's a way to get into some impressions of Italy and uh, to remove some prejudices. I don't know if you got that sense and I hope you did. And I other people have told me that they really felt a strong desire to go to Italy after they read this book because they wanted to have that kind of an experience. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to go to Italy before I read this book, but this book just reinforced <laughs> <laughs> reinforced that, that desire. Jumping in here again once more to, first off, say the phrase Italy porn just makes me laugh, but also it's true and it does make me want to go to Italy. That's one of the places on my list. I have many places on my list, but... We can talk about that on another podcast. We do have to take our second break of the podcast. And when we come back, I'll be concluding my interview with Mariucha. And um, there's, you know, uh, lots more to come in terms of her talking about the book and her writing style and her favorite genres and authors, etc. And you can also see me get really, really awkward about accepting a compliment. So I know you want to stick around for that. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and we'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with author Mariucha Mila about her debut novel, Meet Me in Milano. Here's the conclusion to that interview. In terms of your writing, do you have any advice for aspiring authors who might want, who might have a story that they want to tell? Well, I, you know, I'm a beginner myself and, and a lot, most writers are beginners all the time because you always evolve when you're writing um, one thing that helped me a lot was Stephen King's book on writing. I, I think if someone wants to read one book to help them, that would be the book I would recommend. He definitely is a master. It's not my, my genre of book, but he definitely is a master and he has a lot of wisdom to share about how he did this and how he developed his career uh, while he went through a lot of difficult situations personally. And I think, I think that was useful. The other thing is I would really be careful about reading all of these how to make your book a bestseller kind of books because I, there are a lot of people out there who are just trying to game this and try to write a book to make money. And if you want to make money, there are a lot easier ways to do it <laughs> than writing a book. Right. I mean, really, you've got to be... It's like taking a hammer to your balls or something. You know, trying to make money from the book. <laughs> so I would say that's not that's not the that's not the reason to write a book in my in my opinion. So and the other thing is, you know, I, I will give another piece of advice if I may, sure. which I can export from my design experience. I went to Italy because I wanted to discover why Italians were so creative. And what I discovered were there, is there's really a three-legged stool that they use to base their culture. One is a deep understanding of history. They are really 
really deep historians. They, they have beautiful architecture all around them. They have beautiful things all around them. They integrate that into their understanding very deeply. We're not so good at that in the United States. But if you want to write books, you should read books and then develop an understanding of the history, not through reading books about the history of literature, but by reading the books themselves. And pick time periods and say, maybe I'll read three writers from the 50s and see what, get a feeling and intuition for that. So you need to be a good historian. The next thing you need to be, number two, is you need to be aware of innovation and technology. You have to know what's going on in the world, both about writing technology and publishing technology, as well as technology that is affecting the philosophy of life that is going to be brought into your book, that your characters are going to uh, reflect. And that technology, you know, uh, the avant-gardism of the moment is what makes one person an artist and another person just somebody who draws. And then the third thing is really be tuned into social culture. So you have to know what's going on in the street. You have to get out and see especially what people teenagers and people in their 20s and 30s are doing, you have to be aware of what the trends are. And if you have a deep understanding of these three aspects, then you can have a big head start on doing whatever you do in a more creative way. I, I just think that the, this is what I learned when I was there. People who were designers would go look at art. They would go to theater. They would look for the connections among all the different types of expressions of creativity and learn about what they were saying about the world, what they were saying about the human condition. And then they could learn about how they could have a voice in their history, in the making of the history. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's really interesting. I appreciate your insight on that. Um you mentioned reading, reading different genres, different books from different time periods. Is there any particular genre that you like to read just for your own pleasure? Well, you know, it, I, for a long time when I, was, when I was, you know, in college and a little bit afterwards, I loved everything that was English that was written in the 19th century. I loved it because those books were always about the conflict between the classes and impossible loves that would exist between people who were from different parts of society and how society was really unfair. So like Victorian novels and, and Jane Austen and things like that, those books have beautiful structures, beautiful character development, and, and, and beautiful plot development. Um, so they're good for that. Um, then if you want to read something modern, you know, I, right now, for example, I'm reading Kent Harf, uh Plain Song series. The reason I wanted to read that was because I said, I've got to read something about a, 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 a group of people in a town in a certain particular landscape, because that's kind of the thing that I love. And this is the high place of Colorado, and these people are not exactly the cultured Milanese people that are in my book. So I thought it would be really interesting to look at, you know, another pair of mittens, so to speak, on that same theme. And I'm really enjoying it. You know, modern books that are called modern books, like Hemingway and James Joyce and things like that, I've read those and I like them very much. But there's something about the way they're written, which is very self-consciously art, that fun to read, but if you want to read a story, it's not really necessarily the best mechanism to do that. So I, I think I've, I'm in another place now, which is maybe the story is, is one of the elements of the book, but it's not the driver of the book like it was in the Victorian novel. Mm -hmm. And maybe the language of the book isn't that, you know, sentences without punctuation that makes you always feel like you're reading something that's trying to be a piece of literature, I find that is a little distracting. Right, yeah, me too. I just try to write in my own voice in, in, in the correct grammar. <laughs> I use quotation marks. I may indent my paragraphs, you know. Maybe I'm a, a little bit classical in that respect. But 
I think what's really the most important thing in a book is are you going to touch somebody's soul somehow? Are you going to say, yeah, this is the way life is, and maybe it sucks, and, and maybe, but there's some beautiful things about it. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a brilliant thing. It just has to be like a little, like a sunny day or something happy. I mean, my book's basically a pretty happy book, I think. And, you know, I have enough difficulty dealing with my own tragedies in life. I don't want to write a book that's going to make me wallow in suffering and pain. And so that's just my personality as a writer. I want to write things that are positive and optimistic and give people hope. Yes, that's wonderful, and I really appreciate it. In terms of the book itself, uh, can you tell people where they can find it? Well, you can find it just about anywhere except in a bookstore. Okay. Um, Unfortunately. Um, Amazon, uh, of course. Uh, Meet Me in Milano is available in paperback as well as ebook. And right now, for the month of January, ending on January 30th, I'm actually doing an ebook giveaway on Goodreads. So if you are if you are a member of Goodreads or you want to sign up, it's no big deal to sign up. You can actually request a free copy of Meet Me in Milano just until January 30th, and it will be they pick the winners. So right now there are about 131 people who have requested the book. So there's a good chance of getting it because I, I'm going to be giving away 100 copies. Oh, okay. So, yes, this, the idea is to get people to write reviews of the book, and so this is a promotion. So that's a place where somebody could get the ebook for free right now, um, between now and, and the end of January. Um, Smashwords is selling the ebook. Kobo is selling the ebook. Barnes and Noble is selling the ebook, and Nook Press, which is Barnes and Noble, of course, also has the paperback. Uh, the Apple iBook Store also has the ebook, so it's pretty easy to get. Okay, sounds great. Um, and then and one more oh, thing. No, go ahead. No, I just wanted to give you my handle for Facebook and Instagram. I was just going to ask already- you that. So, <laughs> okay, that's perfect. So it's yeah. Or think great minds think alike, That's right? right. Yeah? Yes. So um, it's my handle for both Instagram and Facebook is at Mario Mila, and that's spelled M A R I U M I L L A. Do you have a website that people can go to as well, or just the the social um, media? No, I I have a website, but not I ha- I don't have a Mario Tramilla website now up right now because I'm building a new one. Okay. So but what I do have is I have a page I have an author uh, profile on Medium. I write, I also write nonfiction essays on Medium, and that's under Mary Scipioni, which is S. C I P I O N I, which is my real name. Okay. But if anybody wants to get in touch with me, I would love that. Uh, if anyone wants to know more, I would hope that anybody who is uh, brave and kind and generous en- enough to grab my book and read it and possibly send a review out someplace, please get in touch with me. I'd love to talk to you personally and I'd love to hear what you think. And also, maybe things you didn't like. Because I'm always evolving and developing, and I really depend on my readers to give me feedback. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, reader interaction is uh, so important when it's constructive and helpful. It is. And Sarah, I, I have to give you a shout out too here, because I think that what you're doing is incredible. You, you've got a lot on your plate, and you're going to the trouble to give some airtime to writers. and. I know you're a writer yourself. Well, thank you. I, that, that's so wonderful for you to say. I really appreciate it. I just, I love, I, I grew up in a family of readers, so I love reading and I love books and I, I just want to, I just want authors to get as many props as they can get because what you do is amazing yeah. and you pour your heart and your soul into what you do. So thank you for that. Well, that's great. And I, and I appreciate it very much too. And I appreciate my readers very much and I hope to uh, share stories with them. Yeah. Is there anything else that you would like people to know about you or your books or just anything that we haven't covered? 
I think I've given an idea and I hope I've created some curiosity about my stories. And um, I do hope you'll jump on um, this adventure with me and, and meet me in Milano. Yeah, and I'm actually excited to uh, for the second book and to learn a little bit more about Lella's story. Will will all of the five books kind of interact in certain ways or intersect? Excuse me, in certain ways with either characters or location. I know you said Italy, but will we encounter yes, some of the same they characters? Def- they definitely will. They there is there's only one character in the second book, and that's because I have to write about what I know and where I am. You know, it's it's just too abstract otherwise. And they, they, there will be characters that will reoccur. It's not exactly a series. I, I don't know yet whether I want to make it into a, an official series. I think that it makes the characters real. And, and some people have actually asked me if I could write another book with a certain character in it. So, I'm, you know, I, I don't really take direction from readers necessarily, but I had the same desire. So that's what I'm doing. And I will keep you posted. That's wonderful. Thank you. And um, I would love to have you back and we could talk about some of the bo- the other books when they come out. Sarah, thank you so much. Oh, thank you for taking some time out of your weekend to talk to me. I wish you luck and success in the writing of the next book. And I can't wait to hear more about Lilla. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck to you, too. Oh, thank you. Have a good day. Once again, and as always, I want to thank my guest, author Mariucha Mila, for taking the time out of her weekend to join me for this interview. I so appreciate all of my authors for taking the time to share their passion and their writing and their their stories with me. I do so love it. So thank you to Mariucha. Thank you to you, my listeners, for joining me again for another interview. I hope you will check out the book and you will check out the continuing series about these characters and Mariucha's um, settings and stories of Italy. I'm looking forward to seeing how the story continues and the characters evolve, which characters reappear in the coming books. So looking forward to that. And thank you again for joining me. I hope you will join me again next week. I'll be speaking with author Greg Levin about his book In Wolves Clothing and looking forward to that just as I'm looking forward to, I know I just said looking forward to like six times in a row, but I am looking forward to so many things. The continuation of the series next week week's interviews, etc. Joining you again. I hope you are looking forward to more interviews. I hope you have a stack of books that you have to read that you are looking forward to. Just so many things to look forward to in life. One being me never saying that phrase in this podcast. At least this episode. Again, I'll try not to. In the meantime, you can find all of our podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. I would love to hear from you and see what you think about interviews. See if there's anyone that you would love to see on the podcast, here on the podcast, excuse me. And of course, you can download those podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, any app that you use for your mobile device. Thank you again for joining me. Please join me again next week. In the meantime, go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.